Once again, good morning and welcome to day two of SBCN's Activate Your Impact Nonprofit Policy Summit. My name is Dana L. Neal. I'm SBCN's Learning and Member Engagement Director, and I'm excited to have you all with us for this special keynote session, Driving Fearless Advocacy, Fireside Chat with Fred Blackwell. Before we invite our speakers up, I do want to take a moment to acknowledge the land that each of us are on today. Here in San Jose, I am living, learning, and organizing on the land of the Mawekma and Tamiya and Ohlone tribes. Together, let us commit to educating ourselves and advocating for Indigenous people here as well as abroad. I know that people here are tuning in from different areas, so I do encourage you to learn what land you are on by using the website that we're going to share in the chat and share that information in your introductions. And with that, while I go through some guidelines for the summit, we'd love to learn who's in the room with us. Please introduce yourselves by sending your name, your title, organization, pronouns, and native land in the chat. We encourage you all to share AYI on social media by using the hashtags AYI22, Activate Your Impact, and Driving Fearless Advocacy, and by tagging SBCN in our speakers wherever you post. We'll also be live tweeting throughout um, the session, and so feel free to amplify those and find the appropriate tags there. Next, for accessibility purposes, we do have automated closed captioning enabled here in Zoom. To activate this, all you have to do is uh, press that little uh, show subtitles or hide subtitles button, um, and you can move that caption around wherever is convenient for you. If you're having any tech or other issues during the session, feel free to private message me directly in the chat. Thank you to our sponsors, First Five of Santa Clara County, San Francisco Foundation, Destination Home, Stanford Children's Health, El Camino Health, Santa Clara Family Health Plan, Kaiser Permanente, and Healthier Kids Foundation for making this event possible and for also helping us make this session specifically free for everyone. We have a jam-packed and insightful conversation today, so please use the chat to send your questions throughout the program. We do ask that all attendees please remain on mute for the duration of the program. This meeting is being recorded for registrants and for those who couldn't make it today or may want to rewatch the recording later on, and we'll send that out in an email in the future. And with that, I'd like to welcome SVCN CEO, Kira Kazansis, to introduce our session and our speakers today. Hi folks, thanks Dana. So on behalf of Silicon Valley Council of Nonprofits, I'm honored to welcome you all to this special keynote session, Driving Fearless Advocacy with Fred Blackwell. And as some of you may know, we had planned to host Mr. Blackwell for our Nonprofit Racial Justice Summit last fall, but as luck may have it, we did have to reschedule that. And so we couldn't really think of a more fitting time to host this important conversation without a fee than during Activate Your Impact, which really provides us an opportunity to discuss how racial justice can and should be at the forefront of our advocacy efforts as a nonprofit sector. SVCN has been on a mission to center racial justice at all levels of our own organization and across the nonprofit sector here in Santa Clara County. Um, many of you know that our nonprofit racial equity pledge that's signed by over 150 organizations, many of whom are here with us today, was our collective commitment to find systemic racism, hold our organizations to higher standards, and co-create and centering community voice a racially just community. Uh, Fred Blackwell here with us today has been on a lifelong journey of advocating for justice in the Bay Area and as the CEO of the San Francisco Foundation led the organization in its own renewed commitment to social justice through an equity agenda focused on racial and economic inclusion. This transition to transforming the systems that perpetuate inequities rather than solely focus on direct services mirrors what SVCN and so many of us here envision as possible for our region. And so we welcome hearing directly from Fred on his journey, experience, and his vision for how we can come together to advocate for equity. We're also really pleased and honored to have Jamal Williams, who's the Director of Advocacy for Racial Justice at San Jose State University, facilitate this virtual fireside chat. In his position at San Jose State, Jamal is tasked with developing a strategic approach to the university's efforts to address systemic oppressive and racial injustice at the institution. He also serves as one of the co-chairs of the Black Leadership Kitchen Cabinet of Silicon Valley, and he's an active member of the nonprofit Real Coalition. Jamal, I'm going to hand it off to you now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kira. Uh, thank you, Dana, and thank you for SVS, SVCN for having me today, and I am honored and thrilled to lead this conversation uh, with Mr. Fred Blackwell. Fred, how are you doing today? I'm doing wonderful. How are you? Oh, man, I'm awesome. I'm excited, and I'm really excited for everybody to get a chance to learn from you. Um, and I will be taking mental notes since I've, if I tried to take real notes, I'd struggle. Um, today, we are here for Activate Your Impact, and the theme is entitled 
driving fearless advocacy. And I really wanna key in on the word fearless and get your take on what that theme means to you um, and the work you're doing and, 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 and what it really means to be fearless in that work. Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be in this conversation today with you, Jamal, and happy to be uh, with a bunch of folks uh, today talking about this topic. I saw a few people uh, who are familiar in the chat. And so to those folks, hey, how you doing? Um, just, you know, a few things come to mind, uh, Jamal, when I think about the, the title and think about fearless advocacy. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is, um, it, for me, it's about advocating for um, solutions uh, to um, issues that we're grappling with um, in a way that uh, meets the moment. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is, um, you know, I've been in this work for a really long time, um, um, longer than I like to think about it, actually, Jamal, uh, to tell you the truth. And, you know, when I think about the last couple of years uh, and the ground that's been covered and the kind of openings uh, that have revealed themselves, um, it's made, you know, there, there have been a lot of like divisions for sure. Uh, that have been highlighted, but I also see just all kinds of opportunities uh, that have been opened up. We are having conversations uh, about race, uh, about class, about opportunity, about inequity, uh, and people are doing a level of self-reflection around these issues that I've never seen before. Uh, and I think that that opens the door uh, to a level of kind of introduction of solutions uh, and the introduction of concepts that people may not have been able to be able to wrap their heads around or be able to address or embrace before. And so when I think about fearless advocacy, I think about first kind of what are those things that we need to be putting in front of people, really pushing for right now that we didn't have the opportunity to really put in people in front of people before and, and get true consideration. Uh, in the past, you know, just an example of that for me uh, is, you know, we had at the foundation had been supporting a group called the uh, Black Organizing Project uh, for uh, years. And, you know, one of the things that they were advocating for was actually getting police officers out of schools. Uh, and, uh, you know, they had been advocating for that and pushing for it and going to the school board for years. Uh, and people really weren't paying attention to it. But this last couple of years, Finally, the door swung open for an opportunity to make that happen, and they made it happen. Uh, and so that is an example of fearless advocacy. I, you know, the other thing that comes to mind um, is moving without fear uh, that the door won't be open for long. You know, all the last couple of years, people have talked about, and there's been all this hand wringing, hand wringing around. So, how long will the window be open? How long will people be receptive to these kinds of concepts? How long will people be open to talking uh, about race? And you know, the result of that uh, is, I think people are um, rushing. Uh, and I don't want to sit here and say that we shouldn't be acting with urgency because we should. But I've been surprised at how many times I've had to actually end the conversation and tell people to slow down. Uh, because the, when you do all the, the hand wringing and act like you need to push everything that you had in your tool belt or in your briefcase through the door, now you actually um, incentivize uh, a movement towards um, self-fulfilling prophecy around the door not being open for long. If right. we act right. like the door is not going to be open for long, guess what? Yeah. It won't. Yeah. Uh, but if we act like it will, uh, it'll allow us to be deliberate around the kinds of things that we want to um, work on. You know, the last thing I, I would say about uh, being fearless is my mom has a saying. Uh, some of you all probably are familiar with my mom. My mom is Angela Glover Blackwell. Um, and, you know, she's the founder of Policy Link. She's been involved in uh, this work uh, for a long time. If I've been in it for a long time, she's been in it forever. Uh, and so, you know, she often tells me, uh, is particularly when she thinks about the role that I play in philanthropy, Jamal. Uh, you know, in philanthropy, we make we t uh, pay a lot to kind of building up um, reputation uh, as social capital. And my mom always says, what's the use of developing a good reputation unless you're willing to risk it? 
Uh, and this is one of those moments where uh, we all need to be willing to risk our reputations for the things that we think we believe in and the things that we think are solutions to the problems that are facing us, particularly around racial equity and economic inclusion. Oh my goodness, you dropped so many gems. Um, you know, when you talked about slowing down, but still having urgency. I mean, we, we look at we look at the, the 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 cities that rush to like take money away from their policing, and then a year later they're giving it all back because it didn't work. But that was just a knee jerk reaction, and they didn't they didn't they didn't slow down to actually plan and strategize how to how to how to how to support the communities that need exactly. to be supported. And then you talk about risk, and I think that's very timely. Um, especially since we're, we're in Black History Month and we think about everything that Black people had to risk to advance civil rights, racial rights, justice for their lives, just to have basic things. The risk came with that and, and, and they had to risk their lives. And you're talking about reputation, which, which, which isn't on the, same, on the same magnitude. So I think you really touched on and hit on some really good pieces there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanna, before we get into some questions, right? People have come here, you know, get some insight into how they can do their work, how they can really hone in um, and, and be fearless, advocate uh, for things that, are, that, are, that we need uh, as a society. But, I, but before we do that, I wanna hear a little bit about you and allow you to tell more about yourself and, and, and how your own background um, has made an impact on your, your trajectory of work. Yeah, Jamal, you know, it's a, it's a good question. Um, I have been um, immersed in this kind of work for as long as I can remember. Uh, you know, I, uh, I grew up in Oakland. Uh, I grew up in a family of people uh, who were active in Oakland. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, we talked about this stuff at the dinner table. Uh, and uh, I, you know, walked, I walked precincts for people who were, you know, running for city council at early age fell asleep in many a city council meeting. Uh, you know, that, so, you know, and, you know, my, my, um, my family were people, you know, they were nonprofit professionals, they were teachers, they were social workers. Um, and my mom's side of the family was particularly uh, active. And, you know, my, um, my parents were so active and so committed to uh, this work that they actually sent me to the school in Oakland that was founded and run by the Black Panther Party called the Oakland Community School. Uh, so I remember going on field trips to San Quentin to visit political prisoners. And I also remember being, and you, some of you all will, re this will resonate with some of you all. Um, I was the little kid in the back of the room uh, at the community uh, meeting with the coloring book, wondering why everybody was so upset and when we could, when we could go home. Uh, so like, you know, like I was really immersed in that. And, you know, uh, from my mom's side of the family and all that kind of stuff, I was exposed early on to social justice, economic justice, all that kind of stuff. Um, but then my father um, side of the family also had an impact on me. My, my dad was um, uh, first in his uh, family to really go to college. Um, his uh, uh, parents really never graduated from middle school. They grew up in South Carolina, Jamal. And you know, as soon as my uh, grandfather and grandmother were old enough, they moved from South Carolina and went to Harlem. And my grandfather actually owned a bar and grill on 125th Street, right around the corner from the Apollo. Uh, and I tell that story uh, because my grandfather used to tell me uh, two things. My father moved him out in the 80s, and so I spent a lot of time with him. Uh, and he used to tell me two things every day. One was, uh, when you leave New York, you're not going anywhere. Uh, and the second thing was, if it's not a Cadillac, it's not a car. Uh, and the reason why I raised that is because all of that was my grandfather's connection uh, to Harlem. And that really uh, brought home for me the importance of place. And so my whole career uh, has been around this intersection of like social justice, economic justice and place. So the th stuff that I've done in local government, the stuff that I've done in nonprofits, the things that I've done uh, in philanthropy have been around the pursuit of solutions around that intersection. Uh, so sorry to be long-winded, but you know, that, that really uh, has been what's been um, uh, really influential in my life. It's really been a uh, family and that early upbringing and being exposed to these issues early on and uh, really wanting to have, have an impact uh, at that intersection. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, really quick, I have a follow-up question, but uh, what was at the dinner table when y'all were talking? What were y'all eating at the time when y'all were? Man, you know, it, it, all, it all depends. Uh, okay. You know, we, uh, uh, you know, in Oakland, we got a, a, a multicultural uh, cuisine uh, going on over here. So, you know, we'll, on any given night, it could be Chinese food, uh, it could be Southeast Asian, it could be soul food. Yeah. Uh, you know, we just passed uh, uh, New Year's. So, you know, that's a that's a day of black eyed peas and chitlins for us. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so, you know, all that stuff. And so you talk about the importance of place. Um, do you feel like organization, because place is important. Sometimes uh, uh, sometimes we, we we get caught up in our work and we don't really stop to think about the, the actual neighborhood and who's in it or the actual city and who, who's comprising it, what, what's, what's going on in the day-to-day -day and how that's impacting lives. Do you, do you think that um, organizations are, are doing enough to, to bridge those in terms of their work and, and, and place in the, in, the, in the way you put it? Yeah, you know, I, I think that um, place is a really important um, frame. Uh, you know, I, there's a lot of uh, things that we work on and uh, we in, engage in advocacy around a, a lot of different issues, whether it's housing, education, economic development, environmental justice. Um, but sometimes I think we tend to forget uh, that, you know, people um, experience the world um, in a very place-oriented way. Uh, you know, your neighborhood, where you go to work, where you worship, where you get your hair cut. Uh, all that stuff. And I think it really highlights for me, and it's the reason why I was actually attracted to the San Francisco Foundation, both the importance of being neighborhood and community oriented um, in, in the work, but also recognizing that all of that fits within a regional context. Uh, and I don't think that we think enough at a, and act enough at a regional level of scale, uh, Jamal. I mean, uh, when you think about these issues, housing issues, economic issues, these are not issues that conform neatly to neighborhood or even city, city boundaries. We experience the Bay Area as the Bay. Uh, and so uh, I think that we have to kind of um, dig down to a neighborhood level because that is where everything is relevant for folks. But we also have to telescope out from time to time to a regional level of scale because that's the scale uh, that really makes sense and that's how people experience the world. Absolutely, appreciate that. Um, I'll segue a little bit. You, you kind of talked about um, your work at the foundation, but for those who may not be as familiar with, with what you all do at the San Francisco Foundation, um, can you share some of the work that you've done, the projects you funded um, and, and, and go on from there? Yeah. Um, so um, I've been at the foundation for almost, um, it'll be eight years in June. And, um, you know, I spent the first three months or so trying to find the bathroom. Um, and after I did that, quickly pivoted to um, the kind of external world. And we launched a series of uh, town hall meetings. We invited people into the foundation for half day sessions where we were listening to thought leaders, partners, policy folks, that kind of stuff. Um, and we um, literally drank data from a fire hose. Uh, we looked at uh, data in the Bay Area disaggregated by race, by gender, by geography, uh, by issue. And you know, I'm not gonna uh, bore you with the whole story, but the long story short uh, is that whether it was at the town hall meetings we had uh, in the half day sessions that we uh, uh, invited people to, or when we were looking at the data, um, all uh, arrows were pointing in the same direction. Uh, and they were basically saying that uh, we were living at a time and in a place where uh, there was a lot of prosperity, opportunity being generated, uh, but access to it was limited. Uh, and it was limited based on where people were living, what their family's economic status might be, uh, or something as simple as their race and or ethnicity. And so um, we reoriented the foundation around the North Star that was about uh, creating a greater degree of racial equity and economic inclusion in, in the Bay Area. Uh, we went away from organizing ourselves around issue areas like community development, community health, education, arts and culture, et cetera, uh, and reorganized around uh, what we consider the pathways to equity, uh, which revolve around the concepts of people, place, and power. Uh, and the people work is really about 
um, uh, lifting uh, the floor uh, for low wage workers and fostering a greater sense of econ uh, economic opportunity and mobility uh, and removing systemic barriers to opportunity. Uh, things like involvement in the criminal justice system, things like uneven access to uh, quality health care or education, uh, those kinds of things. Um, the, the people, the place work uh, is really about the recognition, re recognition that where you live can be a springboard to opportunity or a center to the lack thereof. Um, and so a lot of that work is about um, housing, housing affordability, protecting tenants, uh, anti-displacement work, uh, supporting small arts and culture oriented neighborhood focus groups because we think that arts and culture uh, is a really important part of placemaking uh, and supporting key institutions at the neighborhood level. Uh, and then the power work uh, is really about the recognition that we could have all the bright ideas that we want uh, around people in place, but if it's not connected to a constituency of people who are demanding change, change won't happen at the level of scale that we want or with the sustainability that we want. So the power work is about supporting advocacy, organizing, leadership development, and all that kind uh, of work. And so generally speaking, those are the kinds of things that we're funding. Um, the last December, um, uh, my board made the decision to increase spending from its endowment uh, for the next five years and to dedicate that incremental uh, increase to supporting organizations that are led by and working in BIPOC communities uh, and pursuing transformative change. And so uh, we've been supporters of uh, an effort called the California Black Freedom Fund, which is supporting Black-led groups that are pursuing transformative change. Uh, we are uh, supporting another similar kind of effort that is focused in on the region here. Uh, we're supporting similar efforts that are focused in on uh, Latinx and AAPI communities. And we're supporting efforts that really encourage and support transformative solidarity because we think it's important to do racial, racially and ethnically specific work, but we also think that it's important for us to be able to have solidarity across racial and ethnic groups. And so those are the kinds of things that we're supporting. And the last thing that I would say, Jamal, is um, you know, our bread and butter is the grant making that we do with our endowment, and we act as a platform for others to do their philanthropy through because we're a community foundation. So we house donor advised funds and, uh, and things like that. But we think that the real um, or most important role that we play uh, in community is that of kind of town square. Uh, so we try to uh, leverage our relationships, uh, um, uh, use our voice when appropriate uh, and exert leadership around the issues that we, we care about uh, and the uh, convene people to uh, come up with, uh, identify problems and come up with solutions. And so uh, those are the things that we uh, are doing. And this is the last thing. Um, we, uh, we use our endowment uh, to move the needle on issues that we're focused in on. So we have a program related investment program where we're making loans to uh, initiatives that are supporting uh, the creation of jobs and new affordable housing. Uh, and uh, we try to align our investment dollars uh, around our mission as well. And so we have a, a $50 million mission aligned investment program where we uh, look to both get good returns and uh, do well and do good in the community uh, too. And, you know, one of the things that we're proud of is that, um, you know, 30% per of the assets under management of the foundation are actually managed by women or people of color. Uh, we think that that's a, a good number, but we also think that we have a lot of room to grow there. So uh, I hope what you can kind of get a sense of is that we try to use all the tools in our tool belt in order to move our mission. I mean, yeah, it, your answer to me embodies the, the title of the, of the conference, right? Of uh, activating, right? You're activating, you're having an impact and you're activating it. Um, and, and, and to me, the fearless part, a lot of times, um, you hear a conversation about doing work uh, centered around class um, or centered around kind of all underrepresented, you know, uh, communities, but you all are specifically taking uh, an approach to target, directly target specific ra racial and ethnic communities um, in the work that you're doing. Was that, um, what sparked that or was that challenging to kind of uh, get, get everybody behind? Did you have any, any challenges or barriers there? Yeah, you know, um, 
Jamal, I think that the, I have found that the biggest challenge to doing this kind of work uh, in the Bay Area uh, is that we in the Bay Area um, have a perception of ourselves that's out of line with reality. Um, you know, we like to think of ourselves as a, a dark blue region in a blue state. Um, you know, we uh, like to think of ourselves as this kind of uh, ultra liberal and progressive uh, place that is uh, tolerant and inclusive. And, uh, you know, I can go on with other adjectives as well. Um, but the reality is that if you're a person of color or a low income person in the Bay Area, um, nine times out of 10, uh, that's not how you experience the back. Uh, and I think that that uh, is one of the, the biggest challenges uh, of doing this kind of work uh, in this region. Uh, it requires you uh, to hold the mirror up to the community um, that is, um, and, and what people see in that reflection makes them uncomfortable. Uh, and, you know, so uh, that to me uh, has been the biggest challenge. Uh, we like to think that we don't have that problem. Uh, that's something that happens over in Tennessee or Mississippi, uh, you know, but it's, it's right here. And, I, you know, I can name uh, one issue after another uh, that people associate with other parts of the country where we experience and either, either experience it in a tense way or sometimes we were even ground zero for it. Uh, and so... Uh, to me, that's been one of the bigger challenges. And, you know, the, the reaction uh, when you hold that mirror up uh, can be pretty intense as well. Uh, you know, you, you often find yourself uh, being the skunk at the picnic, um, running everybody out the room. Uh, and so I think one of the challenges is uh, to be, on the one hand, um, really thoughtful and truthful and transparent and sometimes strident about the challenges, the challenges that we face as a community when it comes to race. But to do that in a way um, that doesn't clear the room, uh, do it in a way that really invites um, everyone to lean into coming up with uh, solutions. And threading that needle is not always easy. Uh, uh, but I think that that's one of the biggest challenges for us in this work. Yeah, and again, I think that goes back to the, the idea of being urgent. While moving, while moving at a, a slow enough pace to really take in all the details and, and be de deliberate and thoughtful about how you present that, present that message to be able to call people in. So mm -hmm. um, we talked about it a little bit, but what, what do you think some other challenges are that you all face um, as a, as a, in your work as a foundation? And, and, and I'm really thinking about how you decide what to do with the, the, the resources that you have and, and how you make those decisions. Yeah, um, a, a few other challenges I would say here is, um, you know, we are partially because of the market and also because of kind of efforts that we've made to um, increase our uh, impact in the region. We're at about um, $2 billion of assets under management now. And um, you know, it's always the person in the room with the money who says that money isn't uh, um, the, the determining factor uh, on this stuff. But I do have to say, um, it, it's not enough. And, you know, to the point around uh, advocacy, I was um, really surprised when I got into philanthropy, particularly coming from the public sector. Most of my career had been in local government before I came back to uh, the San Francisco Foundation. Um, and I was struck uh, by how many folks in philanthropy in the nonprofit world um, actually kind of um, were fooled into thinking that we could move the needle on some of these issues that we were working on, really thorny, large scale issues without engaging government and without engaging in systems thinking and policy change. Uh, you know, the, 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 the predominant kind of point of view was that the, the kind of a jewel in the crown, what would revolved around programs and services at scale. And, you know, programs and services at scale are necessary, um, but they are also insufficient 
uh, to achieve change and impact at the level of scale that we're looking at. And so, you know, for example, if you just take um, maybe the healthcare foundations uh, in the state of California, you know, we've got huge ones, California Endowment, um, the Wellness Foundation, Sierra Health, California Healthcare Foundation, huge healthcare oriented foundations. If you add up what those folks spend statewide annually, it's probably less than the Alameda County Public Health Department budget. Uh, and so we've got to think bigger and think about how we can influence public systems if we really want to really positively impact the, the lives of the folks that we're really focused in on. And so a big challenge uh, is to get people to understand the importance of advocacy, organizing, systems change, policy work in terms of moving the needle on the kinds of things that we want to move the needle on. I think another challenge, particularly when we start to talk about race, in equity is that um, too many of us are in a scarcity mindset, which leads us down the road of thinking uh, that one community's gain has to be another community setback. Uh, and so that is another challenge. The challenge of uh, moving into a mindset that is about abundance and solidarity rather than thinking about um, the focus on, for example, um, Black and in Indigenous communities as somehow a threat to Asian and Latinx communities. Uh, you know, my mom, I, I mentioned my mom again, she wrote a, an article, somebody you might've seen it in the Stanford Innovation Review um, called The Curb Cut um, uh, in, uh, Effect. Uh, and really what that is about is the recognition, uh, the curb cuts, uh, you know, those places in the, the sidewalk where it goes down to uh, the ground that was the result of advocacy for, with people for people who have mobile disabilities so that they can get across the street and move around just like everybody else. Um, that that kind of approach, because if you look at a curb cut and you look at who's using them, Jamal, uh, it's, you know, the lawyer uh, with the suitcase full of briefs. It's the mother with the baby carriage. Is the catering service going from one job to the next. Curb cuts are the perfect example of how if you meet the needs of the most vulnerable among us, everybody benefits. Uh, and so we need to take that kind of orientation and approach. Uh, if we can meet the needs of the folks who are the most attacked, uh, the most marginalized, um, the, the most um, villainized when it comes to this stuff, um, then we all benefit. Uh, you know, you take Black Lives Matter. Uh, if you have, if you find a, a police department that recognizes that Black Lives Matter, I bet you it's a police department that speaks, treats everybody with dignity and respect. And if we use that orientation. Um, that is how we get to where we want to go. We won't get to where we want to go uh, when every time the Latinx community makes a progress, the Black community says, what about me? Um, we have to have a, an approach to this work that recognizes that once we meet the needs of folks who are um, experiencing the most pain, Jamal, that's when we all benefit. Yeah, I want to I want to stay here for a little bit because I think it's really powerful, um, and I absolutely 100% agree with you. I think in my work, um, I have to engage in that conversation a lot. Um, and you talked about you talked about calling people in. You talked about helping people recognize that we're not in a scarcity model. Something that I hear often is that, well, we can only do so much for, and we'll we'll use like the black community in um, in the South Bay uh, in in Santa Clara County because there's only three percent of you. So we, we we can only dedicate so much to 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 impact a group that's three percent. And my 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 pushback is that well, there used to be more. What are we doing to address the fact that there aren't, <laughs> that we used to be here? How do you, what would you offer to our attendees to, to, to be able to, to have that conversation um, in a way where people can actually hear it? Because sometimes even just saying, like you mentioned Black Lives Matter, um, uh, that, does, that speaks to my ears in, in a way that it doesn't speak to other people's, right? So like, yeah. how, would you, how would you offer that? Yeah. You know, um... 
I'll just say up front, you know, I um, I don't have the silver bullet to the answer to that question, but I do have a, a few thoughts. Um, one is that um, we do ourselves a disservice um, when we um, engage in or fall victim to the gaslighting around the, the origins and the beginnings of this country uh, and different regions in the country. And, and when, I, when, I, when I say that, Jamal, what I mean is um, once you fully understand uh, that this country uh, was built on the pursuit of free labor and free land. Free labor um, resulting in uh, slavery, bondage, Jim Crow, uh, those kinds of things. Free land resulting in the genocide of Native American folks. Um, once you understand that, you understand in a different way um, that the number of people in the South Bay that are Black and Indigenous has little to do uh, with the need to address uh, the, um, the needs uh, and the aspirations of Black and Indigenous folks because your fates are intertwined. Uh, you don't have to be Black or Indigenous to be falling victim to um, the um, the results of anti-Blackness um, and anti-Indigeneity. Um, and so that is a really important frame uh, to be um, white, could be Asian, could be Southeast Asian, to understand uh, that your situation is real. Uh, and it's, and it's um, not diminishing it at all, but it's important to understand that part of the analysis is that you've been caught up in anti-Black systems uh, that have been perpetuating oppression. That, and that oppression has a um, wake that involves more than just Black and Indigenous people. Uh, and so that is really, is really, really important for folks to uh, understand. Um, the other thing that I think is really, really important is that, um, you know, we've got to do a better job of really um, articulating what I talked about before, which is that, you know, the fact that we're really all in this together. Um, and it's not, and that, that focusing in on one particular group, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's an allocation decision that's being made. It's a design feature. So for example, you know, we're doing some work around universal basic income. The idea here isn't that uh, if we're gonna center uh, anti-Blackness in, in designing that universal basic income uh, program, it, the idea isn't that only Black people get access to the UBI program. The idea is if you design a program that is meeting the needs of the Black folks in the community, if it's three of them and they're doing the worst, it's going to be a program that actually is going to work well for everybody. Folks need to understand that that's the frame. It's not an exclusive frame. It's an inclusive frame. And it's about designing for uh, the folks who are least likely to be able to benefit from this thing if you don't design it to meet their needs. That's really, that's really powerful. Um, and I remember the first time I, I, I heard somebody say, if you, can, if you can provide for the most disenfranchised, then, 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 you're, then, you're re then that, that's what equity is, right? And I think that's, that's exactly what you echo. Um, we had some questions come in uh, as people registered, and one of them touches on what you just talked about in terms of nonprofit organizations and your organization getting involved um, with, uh, 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 the municipalities with government. Um, and so the question is asking about how you work with elected officials. How do you push them? Um, how do you push them to be publicly supportive of something that might be too aggressive for them or might, 
it, 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 something even around universal basic income and, 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 and centering the most disenfranchised could be uh, um, an issue that, 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 that could be seen as divisive in their district or in their assembly or how do you get that needle to move? Yeah, um, you know, the, I know there are a lot of folks on here who are experienced organizers and, and advocacy folks. And, you know, one of the uh, things that I learned early on from people who were steeped in this work is you got to have a, both a strong inside and outside game. Uh, and so, you know, what that means is that uh, on the one hand, you need to uh, have a, a part of your strategy that is about being at the table, working with folks who are in power, um, bringing them the data, under, showing them the way um, that, that you're talking about, crafting um, well thought out uh, legislation and, and policies and that kind of stuff. That's the inside game. The outside game uh, is building up a constituency of folks who are demanding change, who um, may not be the folks who are a part of the design of legislation and things like that, or the folks who are inside the, the city council meetings and all that kind of stuff, but they're the people who are agitated and the people who um, are holding folks accountable. These are the people who um, are demanding change. And so uh, I think that the formula uh, is to have that inside and outside game. But the inside folks have to be grounded in the outside um, constituency. Uh, once the inside folks go rogue uh, and are no longer grounded by a constituency of authentic folks who are uh, the folks who are um, the most in proximity to the pain, that's when things go awry. Uh, so there's got to be this symbiotic uh, relationship uh, between the folks who are proximate uh, and have experience with the issue with those who are actually on the inside. And I think that's a really important uh, part of this stuff. The other side of this, Jamal, is that um, we tend to focus a lot on the policy win and walk away uh, when that's only half of the battle. The other half of the battle is around policy implementation uh, and governance. Uh, and so, you know, there's one aspect of this that is about organizing and elections. Uh, and there's another side of this thing that is about governance and policy implementation. That's another really, really important uh, part of this whole equation. Yeah, yeah, it makes the it makes the puzzle complex, but it and, and the work endless, but it, but what you said gives us gives us a direction right and, and an approach and recognizing yeah. that it's not one or the other that it has to be both um yeah and this and the solutions have to be complex because yeah. the the problems are complex absolutely you know, I, you know, I don't trust anybody who offers me a simple solution uh to a complex problem yeah uh, as exactly. a matter of fact i have to quote my mom one more time uh she tells me uh and i believe it that if you have found uh a solution to a complex problem that only involves yourself, you either have the wrong solution or don't understand the problem. Mm. And look, as long as I'm the host, you can quote Mama Blackwell as many times as you want. <laughs> so you don't even have to ask for permission. Um, I really like this question and, and, and I'm curious uh, to, to, to hear your thoughts on what it means for you to be authentically and fearlessly black um, in the moment like the one we're in. Um, and, and we know that what happened in 2020 has changed, changed everything, um, changed society for the, for, the, for the future, for the near future. But um, as, a, as a black man yourself, like what, what does that look like and mean to you to be authentic and, and fearless in this moment? Oh man, that's a, it's a great question. And I, um... I thought a lot about it actually uh, over the last couple of years, Jamal, because, um, you know, as I said, I've spent a long time uh, in this work. And uh, as a result, you know, I've done, I've collected a lot of data. I put together a lot of PowerPoints. I've written a lot of memos. 
I've made a lot of presentations and what I thought were really passionate, well thought out speeches. Uh, and in the summer of 2020, um, young people of color and black folks um, were able to make more progress by taking to the streets and saying enough is enough uh, than I was able to make with all my fancy presentations, PowerPoints, and memos. Um, and so that was the first time, Jamal, in my career where I saw the, um, the power and the efficacy of emotion. I spent my whole career um, trying not to come across as the an angry black guy so that someone would listen to me. And the power of emotion um, has been one that's been really liberating. As you could tell from like how I'm showing up, um, it's been transformative for me. I, I don't remember who I was talking to, but I was having that kind of similar conversation and someone was explaining, you know, we were talking about how, you know, you know, people, if they're trying to get something done, have to, you know, you got to make sure, basically you have to package it right. And I said, well, that's not what we learned a year and a half ago. That we didn't, we learned that by packaging it, packaging it right, that may or may not work, but what we can see is that by, by leaning in and being fearless and authentic to that emotion and to who we are, that it can drive change in ways we've never even thought. Um, and, and, and I think that's a, that's a powerful lesson every, for everyone to take because we get so caught up in how it's being presented. And I think your words right there really encapsulated that. Yeah, I mean, to be in this, um, this kind of work that has so much um, emotion and personal stuff attached to it yeah. uh, and to have your emotion uh, not have currency yep. um, it is really um, painful. Yeah. And especially as, as, as black, black people, we learn that our emotion can be detrimental to our lives, to our careers, right? To how people perceive us. And I think we saw it. At some point, people said they didn't care, right? Because our lives were being lost and, and attacked anyway. We're going to show you the, the, the full extent of who we are and demand that things change. Um, and I think, we're, I think we're, moving, we're moving in that direction. And it's only because uh, uh, of the emotion that we saw on display throughout the, the past couple of years. Um, one of the things I just want to go back to you talked about was risk. Uh, being, being like you can't be fearless if you're not willing to risk anything. And I'm, and I'm curious, what do you feel like at the San Francisco Foundation, you all are, are, are risking to, to, to drive and advance um, equity and, and racial justice in your work? And, and what, would, what would you say to other people who are running and leading these organizations? Yeah, you know, as a, as a community foundation, Jamal, I didn't realize this when we started to do it, but it's be, become clear to me now. Um, it's a field where we end up in like this arms race around um, how big you are and how many assets you have under management and how many donors you have and that kind of stuff. Uh, and for the, the prevailing model or approach or strategy has to been as opaque as you can uh, about what you believe in so that you don't run the risk of having a repelling effect on folks who might be contri uh, potential contributors to your uh, work or organization. Um, we're experimenting with a different business model, which is a different, uh, which is kind of risky for us. I uh, didn't really realize it at the time, but what we are doing is uh, we're leading with what we believe in uh, and uh, making the, the bet uh, that um, people will want to join. Uh, and, you know, that sounds um, simple, uh, but you got to be prepared uh, to lose some donors, uh, to grow at a rate that you wouldn't uh, necessarily uh, grow at otherwise. And 
uh, we had to be prepared to lose folks. Uh, and we actually have lost folks. Uh, and we've actually had to ask some folks to leave because they no, were no longer aligned with where we were uh, headed. Um, but guess what? We've gained more than we've lost. Uh, and so when I think about risk for us, it's been about um, risking growth, um, uh, risking um, alienating some folks with wealth who may not want to be associated with our um, agenda. I talked about um, what we're doing on the investment side around um, using our endowment and, and that kind of stuff. Risk may be not having the same level of returns uh, on our uh, investment that we uh, might get otherwise. Guess what? That hasn't been the case. Uh, so, you know, I mentioned that we have 30% uh, of our assets under management with uh, women and people of color. I mentioned that we're doing this mission aligned investment stuff. Uh, and we're one of the top performing endowment investors uh, in the field. Um, and so those are the kinds of things that we uh, are risking. We're stepping out uh, on stuff where uh, it puts us in the uh, crosshairs of folks who um, uh, you know, could be in opposition. We do a lot of work around housing. About, uh, I don't know, uh, two or three years ago, we were um, along with, I saw there were folks from Silicon Valley at home along with Leslie Crisiglia and some other folks, uh, we were associated with 12 or 13 different pieces of legislation uh, in Sacramento around housing that everybody wasn't necessarily crazy about. Um, but you know, we're at a point where uh, we're looking for solutions. We're not looking to uh, avoid people who might be in opposition to us. Yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned Silicon Valley at home. And Yesterday, the, or a couple of days ago, being Valentine's Day, I, would, I will mention in front of everybody that my wife is the executive director, and I love her, um, Ms. Regina Celeste Williams. Uh, so um, I have to say that since you mentioned her organization. I, I think that, I think that the, the idea, when I, what I get from this, uh, what I take away from this entire um, uh, conversation is, is really being willing to, 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 to put yourself out there and that, that real change isn't gonna come without being willing to, to, to give up something, being willing to risk, being willing to, to move in a direction and saying, hey, we're gonna move in this direction and we invite you to come with us, as opposed to saying, you, you use the word opaque, we're going to package what we have and make it so safe and then hope that change comes from that. I think. I think everything you've spoken to really touches on that that, that, that might not be the approach we can use as we move. Yeah, forward. I mean, we won't get there reaching for the lowest common denominator. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, we, we have a couple minutes left. Uh, uh, if anybody has any questions they wanna get in the chat, um, do so now, but um, do you have any takeaways that you, that you want um, our, our, our guests to, 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 to really leave with as they, they think about the work in front of them? Um, yeah, I, I would say a, a, a few things. I know we got, we're short on time. Um, and it, it's just repetitive of stuff that I've um, uh, said in the past, and so maybe I'll add a couple of things. Um, one is that, you know, I know everybody re remembers uh, Al Gore and the inconvenient truth when it comes to uh, environmental uh, um, uh, issues. Um, the first thing I would say is we've got to, in the Bay, um, come to terms with our inconvenient truth, which is that we have a race problem. Uh, and I think it's important for all of us to name that when we can uh, and when we have the opportunity. Um, the second thing is, and it's related to it, is um, once we do that, we got we got to get a lot more comfortable with the discomfort that is associated with talking about race. Uh, you know, we, when we run from the conversation and don't have the conversations because we are uncomfortable uh, about it, and I get it, Jamal. I mean, you know, these conversations are uh, conversations where we make mistakes. They're emotional. People cry. People get upset. People get pissed off. And those aren't the kinds of conversations that I know for me that I necessarily run to be involved in. Uh, so I get it. Um, but we got to get more comfortable with these conversations around race and get more uh, comfortable with the language uh, uh, around it in, in order for us to get to where we want to go as well. Um, 
we got to do more involvement of the people who are closest to the problem uh, in terms of developing the solution. Uh, we cannot be going into the lab and coming up with solutions for other folks. Uh, people need to be involved in decision making and governance. Um, I think that that's really uh, important. Um, we got to be engaged in transformative solidarity again. Um, you know, we got to uh, understand that one community's gain and then another community setback. We got to show up for folks in a way that is transformative. Uh, that means showing up for people when we don't necessarily even fully understand why they're so pissed off. Um, and the last, which is, you know, probably the most esoteric of, the, of them all, um, is uh, we've got it. Well, I'll just, I'll start with this. If equity is just in fair inclusion in a society where everyone can participate, prosper, thrive, and reach their full potential, that means none of us have never really seen that reality which means that um, the, the solution is uh, on the horizon and not in the rear view mirror. Um, and that means that we've got to imagine what it looks like to realize equity. And so we all have to be willing to engage in radical imagination to come up with the true solutions uh, when it comes to uh, the issues that we're grappling with when it comes to uh, equity. Wow, that was <laughs> very well said and very powerful. And I like how you leave us on the note of envisioning, right? And envisioning a future, recognizing that we can be creative and thoughtful and, and, and really imaginative as we're thinking about getting there because we haven't seen it. Um, yeah. and, it, and, it and, and the thing I would just say, Jamal, is that yeah you know, the most egregious form of looking into the rear view mirror for solutions uh, is, you know, a phrase like make America great again. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we on the left also engage in uh, rear view thinking as well. Yeah. Uh, and so I don't want us to think uh, that we are exempt uh, from uh, the need to pivot to a radical imagination that is focused in on the horizon. Absolutely. Uh, this was enlightening. I've learned a ton. I have uh, absolutely appreciated being able to lead this conversation with you, um, steer the conversation and just be part of it. Uh, um, and I, I hope yeah, that- man, I'm mad at you for making me cry, but that's all right. Well, you know, my, <laughs> I, I, my background is in, is, in, is in clinical therapy. So I have made many people, I don't make them cry. They, it comes out. I know how to ask those questions. And I'm just thank you for kind of going on a journey as I'm thinking through those questions and we get some from the audience. Um, and this has been very powerful. Uh, I really do hope everybody's taking something from this. And, and, and Fred, I, I look forward to seeing what you all accomplish and, and, and how you all lead in your space. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. And thank you again, SVCN, for allowing us to have this time. Thank you so much to to Fred and Jamal for that really inspiring conversation. I know that I don't really, I'm still processing. I don't have much to say, but if folks can use the chat and Zoom reactions um, to show them some appreciation. Thank you both so much.